Hello Haskellings. So I cleaned up our code from yesterday a little bit, including putting our integer parser into our advent of code module. I added some documentation there, as you can see. I also inverted our mask value because it actually made sense to have one being an X and zero not being an X. That simplified the bitwise operations a little bit. I'd now like to talk a little bit about a cute little testing framework that Haskell has called doctest. When you run doctest on your source code, it will actually test your examples in your Haddock documentation. Whilst this obviously doesn't rival some of the larger testing frameworks in Haskell, I think it's a really neat way to make sure that your documentation is actually accurate. Let's move on to day 15, and we have ourselves a strange number sequence to generate. I kind of like these puzzles, but they can be really difficult sometimes. Let's have a quick look at our input. So we can start by importing our advent of code module, and because we have a single line of text, we use interact prime. We then split our line on the comma character, and then map read over it. I'm going to give the f function a type signature, so I don't need to give a type to read. Let's just make the output of f equal to 2020 for now, to make sure we've got everything right so far. I'm going to set a top level definition here for the number we're looking for. I'm going to try to first implement this with lists. Lists are a lot more efficient when you're adding elements to the start of the list. So I'm going to reverse the list. Next I'm going to write a recursive function that takes an integer, n, and returns you back the first n elements of the sequence in reverse order. Our base case can just be when n is the length of our original list, in which case we just return our reversed list. OK, so next we write the recursive case. And we know we're going to recurse by subtracting 1 from n, so let's just write that already. We can call that y, y's to split off the last element, which is important for determining the value for our next element, which we're going to call y prime. Now we need to determine if we've seen the last number y before, and we can use lm to find that out. If it's the first of its kind, then we can return 0 for the next element. However, if it's not, then we can use a function called takeWhile. We give it the predicate not equal to y to determine the number of elements between now and the last time we saw y. Let's have a quick look at the documentation for takeWhile. So if we take the length of that list and add 1, we're going to get back the distance between the y's. And that should be all we need to actually get the next value in the list. And we can return the new list by prepending y prime to y colon y's. We then just need to get the head of the list with 2020 elements. So we're ready to check our answer. And it's given us a gold star. The second part of today's challenge is, well, exactly the same as the first, just with a larger number. Our list-based solution is just not going to be fast enough, so we need to consider a way to actually store efficiently the indexes of where we last saw each value. We can use an int map for this. While we're testing, let's just set our target number to a smaller number. I'm going to replace our getList function with a get function that will just get us the ith element in the sequence. When i is less than the length of the list, we can simply look up into x's the ith element. Otherwise, we're going to have to get the ith element through recursion. The getPrime function is going to have to set up the initial conditions for the recursion. We're first going to set up the map and we're going to map from the numbers to their positions. We can do this by zipping our list with the natural numbers and using from list to bring it in as a map. Let's call our recursive function step for lack of a better name. 
The first parameter is going to be the number of iterations left, which we can initialize to target minus the length of our initial array. We're going to have to get the next item using the previous item, so let's add that in there as well and remove it from our initial map. Let's start with the base case then, which is when the first parameter gets to zero. In this case, we can simply return the last element calculated. The general case for our recursive step function is going to use the map to determine the next value, which we're going to call y prime. Then we use recursion to get the subsequent values after that. The calculation for y prime should be similar to what we did before in the getList function. However, this time we're going to look up y in our map to find the last location. If we found the location, then we're going to use that to calculate the distance between now and the last location. We're going to call our current index i and we'll add that to our step function. If y is not in our map, then it's the first time we've seen that value, so we return 0. We need to add i, the current index, to our step function then, so let's do that now. Because we're using zero-based indexing and we start with the last element of the list, the index should start at l minus 1. The recursive call then needs to add 1 to i, and it also needs to insert the last value calculated into our map. Remember that the map is from the value to its position, so we insert y mapped to i into our map. We still have some bugs, and the first is because we didn't yet change our top level definition to call get instead of get list. The next bug is because I got the name wrong for our step function in the recursive call. It should be step and not next. Now that we're getting a result for the value 3000, let's increase that tenfold to see how long it takes. That was pretty quick, so I'm happy at least that it's quicker than our original list solution. So let's pump that right up to the number that we need. Well, that took about a minute to run, and I'm not going to make you sit through that. So let's just check that answer. And indeed, it is the right answer. So while the inmap solution was good enough for advent of code, it seems clear that in an imperative language with mutable data structures, we would have been able to create a much faster solution by using a large array for the mapping. And here, my dear, dear Haskellings, is where I'm going to ask you if you desire to take the red pill and see how far we can go down the rabbit hole, because we can actually do imperative style programming in Haskell using mutable data structures. One such data structure can be found in the data vector unboxed mutable module. It's designed to be used within the IO monad, but we can also use it with the state threads monad and we do that by using run st. This allows us to do mutations within a do block that don't persist outside that do block. I'm going to try to stick as closely as I can to our existing implementation, but because we're in a do block, let's use let to set up the initial state. The first two arguments to our step function are the same as we had before, but our mutable vector we're going to have to initialize somehow. So let's use the output from that zip function to initialize our vector. We create our vector by using the new function from data vector unboxed mutable. And it takes a size, and because we don't know what size to use, I'm just going to use nn, because I know it won't get bigger than that. I'm going to use a function called 4m, which is from control.monad. It's exactly the same as map m, except with the arguments reversed. That is, it'll take a list of values and run a monadic function over it. We take the values from our initial list, and we want to write those into our mutable vector. We can do that using a lambda that takes the value i and its 
location in the list n and writes that using the write function like that. I'm going to assume that if you're still watching, you've probably recognized that I can use uncurry here to simplify this. This will result in a list of unit values which we don't really care about, so there's a variant of 4m called 4m underscore that throws the result away for us. We're ready now to call our monadic step function, which we call with the same parameters as before, except I'd like to use a one-based index, so we call it with l instead of l minus 1. The reason I'd like to use a one-based index is because in true imperative style, I'm going to use 0 to represent not found. Because step is now a monadic function, we're going to have to use return to wrap our y value in the base case. For the general case, we're going to have to replace our int map lookup with a read from our immutable vector. Now, if n is 0, that means that we haven't encountered that value before, so in that case the next number should be 0. Otherwise, like before, we simply subtract n from i to get the last seen distance. We can then save the new position of our previous value into our mutable vector by using write like this. The recursive call will only need to have the int map replaced with our vector reference. We have a compiler error because we forgot to replace this m with a v here. Well, that's now compiling, but we're getting a different value from before, which is a little bit strange. And it's because our initial positions are one based and not zero based. So perhaps I should stick to functional programming after all. Happy Haskelling, everyone.